Hey guys, in today's video we're going to take a look at a Webley Mark IV revolver. The Mark IV was chambered in .455 Webley and is not to be confused with the later 38 caliber Webley Mark IV. The British Army adopted the Mark IV in October 1899, with the vast majority of Mark IV revolvers accepted for service by the British Army between 1899 and 1904, entering service just as the Second Anglo-Boer War began. As such, the Mark IV has become synonymous with the war, becoming known as the Boer War model. Traditionally, until the early 1880s, revolvers had been the preserve of officers who provided their own privately purchased sidearms. However, in 1878 the British Army began issuing revolvers to specialist troops, such as gunners, trumpeters and NCOs. As such, many of the Mark IVs were issued to enlisted troops. The records for the British Army's Director of Army Contracts show that between 1899 and 1903, the revolvers cost between 58 and 61 shillings each. Externally, at a glance, the Mark IV looks little different from its predecessors, retaining the same short 4-inch barrel and the same general layout, as well as the same bird's head style grip of the earlier Mark II and III revolvers it replaced. The first Webley service revolver, the Mark I, was adopted officially in 1890. This armourer's diagram from 1897 shows the components of the earlier Mark I and Mark II revolvers. Most notably we can see the Mark I's humped rather than smooth pistol grip. The Mark IV embodied a number of important improvements. Webley made the barrel, body, cylinder and the cylinder axis pin from special mild steel with the ratchet teeth of the extractor and the lifting point of the pawl case hardened to make them more durable. The width of the slots in the cylinder were increased and the hammer was lightened while retaining the same nose profile as the previous pattern. Despite these changes, Webley sought to maintain parts interchangeability with the earlier Mark III. The trigger stop was raised slightly and the revolver's angles were rounded off a little more than on earlier models but the Mark IV retained that classic angular Webley look. Like its predecessors, the Mark IV had a hinged frame top brake action with an automatic ejector which extracted and ejected cases when the frame was opened. The Mark IV uses Edwinson Green's stirrup latch introduced in 1883. The latch pivots smoothly with the lever falling nicely under the thumb on the left hand side of the frame. This was tensioned by a V-spring on the other side of the frame. The pistol has two triangular wings either side of the frame, just ahead of the cylinder. These were guides which aided the holstering of the revolver. The Mark IV had a six round cylinder and was predominantly loaded with short cased smokeless Mark II .455 rounds. But a Mark III man stopper round with a large nose cavity was briefly used before being removed from service because it contravened the 1899 Hague Convention. The Mark IV also used the new cylinder retention method introduced with the Mark III in 1897. Panted in August 1897 by William Whiting, Webley's chief engineer, the new cylinder retention system allowed for much smoother rotation. Previously, the cylinder axis pin had been retained by a cross screw. In the new system, a small hook engages on a lip at the front of the cylinder when the action was opened. This held it in the frame. The Mark IV had an integral rounded front sight rising out of the top of the barrel and a simple notch rear sight cut into the frame latch. The revolver's hard plastic grips are made from moulded vulcanite rubber and they have diamond pattern checkering and at the base of the bird's head pistol grip, we can see the lanyard loop. We know this revolver was accepted by the War Office, as it is stamped with the arrowhead acceptance mark on many of its major components. When cocking the revolver, you notice how heavy but smooth the hammer and trigger are. Like all other Webley service revolvers, the Mark IV has a double action, single action trigger. By no means a light pistol, the Mark IV was 35 ounces lighter than its predecessor but still weighed 2.2 pounds. The Mark IV and other Webleys were front heavy and the bed's head grip is not exactly ergonomically optimal. 
This wouldn't change until the Mark VI was introduced in 1915. Here we can see the recoil shield or backplate, which was dovetailed into the frame to allow it to be replaced if it wore out. We can also see the hammer pole and the hole the hammer strikes through. Let's take a closer look at the Mark IV's ejector in action. Once the frame has been fully opened and the spent cases have been ejected, the ejector will snap back down into place to allow the pistol to be reloaded. The Mark IV proved to be a good sidearm and its design wasn't modified for 14 years until the adoption of the Mark V in 1913. During this 14 year period, many of the 36,756 Mark IVs delivered to the British Army saw action in a number of colonial campaigns in Asia and Africa, and later during the early years of the Great War. This photograph, taken in August 1914, shows an officer and two NCOs of the 1st Lifeguards preparing to embark for France. The officer wears his pistol on his right hip in an enclosed holster while the NCOs have their revolvers on their left hip in standard issue open-topped holsters. As the war dragged on, the Mark IVs were quickly surpassed by the Mark V, 20,000 of which were made, and the Mark VI, of which over 100,000 were produced by the end of the war. Thanks for watching guys! Head over to thearmorersbench.com to check out our accompanying blog on the Webley Mark IV, and don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And you can now support us over on Patreon. Tab is an entirely viewer supported project and your help is very much appreciated. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one.